And the next speaker is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Kevin Leighton Brown. Uh, Kevin, it's fair to say, is the originator of this field, I, unless you know you want to correct me on that, Kevin, on the use of machine learning in the context of solvers. I think I'm Kevin sure Moshe is, will uh, will send some references in the chat to correct you on that. No, I think I, I think uh, on this one I agree with uh, <laughs> with Vijay. Well, uh, nice of you, Moshe. And uh, so Kevin is a professor of computer science at UBC, got his PhD at Stanford, and he has won many awards for his research, uh, including an NSERC EWR Stacy Memorial Fellowship and uh, several other awards. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Kevin, the floor is yours and you may share your screen and uh, start the talk. Thank you. Thanks, you, you think I'd be faster sharing my screen by now after a year in pandemic. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I made the crack about uh, uh, Moshe sharing the references because the truth is this field goes back uh, a long time in, uh, particularly into systems and you know all, all kinds of you know, different places that kind of ML for solvers kind of cropped up um, before they kind of got unified into this uh, this community that we have today. But uh, but I think it's really exciting that we're at the point where we have Simon's workshops dedicated to this topic. I think this is a really exciting thing. Um, I'm going to uh, speak about um, something a little bit less practical than we've heard from the other speakers today. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, using um, machine learning to directly predict the uh, the result that we would get from a combinatorial solver, um, given the the topic of the the uh, the broader Simon's um, semester. I, I'm going to look at uh, propositional satisfiability, and I'm going to survey a, a whole range of different work uh, that my group has done over the years, um, culminating in some work on end-to-end -end learning uh, using deep learning to to predict propositional satisfiability directly from raw inputs. Uh, to get, so I, I'm going to be uh, throughout speaking about uniform random three sat at the phase transition, not because these are the, the most important sat problems uh, practically to study. It's obviously a bit of a, a toy problem, but it's a, a very clean, well-studied problem that is sort of the, the fruit fly of sat research. It, it's you know, empirically hard. A lot of people have looked at it and uh, it, we have maybe the best theory about it. So um, it's kind of you know, conventional wisdom that at this clauses to variables ratio of 4.26, um, uniform random three sat problems are, um, ha have a 50% chance of being satisfiable, uh, which is true, and they're empirically hard, uh, which is sort of almost true. Uh, here's, um, if we look at uh, actual empirical performance, uh, instance by instance, uh, on a log scale, at the phase transition point, you see that in fact, um, you know, this is where this average hardness spikes, but you also see that uh, there's uh, a lot more variation than, than you might have expected. There's still real, really easy instances at this point as well. So um, some co-authors and I got interested in, in the sort of somewhat ridiculous question of saying, could we use machine learning to, to try to predict you know, which, um, which kind of instance we've got in hand. If we were at this phase transition point, if we had some well-defined set of instances and we wanted to take some new instance from this set and try to determine, you know, is it um, gonna be hard or easy to solve? And so we, uh, in, in a whole string of work, uh, I'll just have sort of citations at the bottom here, but in a whole string of work culminating in a C CACM paper uh, in 2014, we said, uh, let, let's try to find some instance features of a, a SAT instance that we could compute in polynomial time that would give us a handle on uh, its combinatorial structure that we could then use in a model to try to predict whether the instance is, is hard or easy. So the most obvious thing you might think of if you've taken a kind of undergrad algorithms class is the size of the problem. So how many clauses does it have? How many variables does it have? What's the clauses to variables ratio? Uh, of course, these will all be constant if I was looking at the, the uh, the uh, phase transition point. Then I can look at other things like syntactic properties. Um, for example, what's the ratio of positive to negative uh, clauses uh, in, the, uh, in the formula? 
I can then build various constraint graphs and say, such as the, the factor graph, the clause clause graph, or the variable clause graph. I can ask things like, uh, what are the average degree statistics in the graph, or what are path lengths in the graph, or how clustered are the graphs? I can use the uh, search space size estimate due to Don Knuth, where you, um, you, you look at the, uh, you make sort of random probes um, in, in a sort of DPLL space and say, what's the average depth in the tree? And, uh, and that's a, a, an estimate of the log number of nodes in the tree. Um, I can do, um, look at the cumulative number of unit props that I would get at different depths using a, a given heuristic, like the SADC heuristic, and say, um, how amenable to this heuristic does the, uh, uh, the formula appear to be. I can take local search algorithms, even if uh, the algorithm that ultimately I'm interested in is not a local search algorithm. And I can say, um, using some bounded amount of time, um, what happens when I run the local search heuristic? Do I, um, do I find that I um, you know, quickly reach a plateau or does it improve a lot? Or, or how much variation do I get in the kinds of um, trajectories that I see in this sort of bounded local search unrollings um, across different random restarts of the local search heuristic. And finally, I can take a, a linear programming relaxation of the problem, um, and, uh, and then I can look at the slack vector of this um, linear program, the, uh, uh, you know, how far from integral the, uh, the variables in linear programming relaxation are, and, and um, take like a norm of that vector or a, a, a coefficient of variation of that vector, um, get, get a sense of how close it is to integral. So, so we built all kinds of features like this. You know, I, this wasn't meant to be uh, comprehensive, and it certainly wasn't meant to be formal. But it gives you a sense of the, the kinds of things you could dream up, and um, you, you could probably dream up more. So, um, so then w using um, pretty simple uh, regression kinds of methods, we were able to um, build uh, models that predict um, uh, that make predictions like this. So here I'm saying on the x-axis. What was the actual uh, runtime on a log scale um, of uh, a SAT solver like KCNFs? And on the y-axis, uh, what do we predict the runtime to be? And you know, we would like to exactly nail this this diagonal red line. And uh, what we got here was uh, pretty good. You know, it's always hard to sort of eyeball a scatter plot, and I could give you numbers which are also kind of hard to interpret. Uh, but you know, we're we're able to do um, reasonably well in in predicting um, unseen problems at the uh, phase transition point where um, the closest to variables ratio is telling us nothing. So uh, we found this intriguing and we wanted to dig in. So we started saying, um, what if I tried to build much smaller models that I could then interpret? Uh, and we did this by um, using um, forward selection, which is a, a greedy way of doing variable selection in, a, uh, in some kind of model framework. So here we were using quadratic regression. Um, and so we we iteratively added features to the quadratic regression and, and and found that four variable models in this case did pretty well. So so here was a good four variable model, and here's how much it hurt us to lose uh, just scaled to uh, hundred percent. Here's how much it, it cost us to lose each of these four variables. Uh, and so you see the last one was the least valuable. And, and interpreting this, we can see that. Uh, these local search um, probing features that I told you about were important all over the place. So every one of these four um, um, quadratic um, features that, that we've learned here includes one of these uh, uh, local search probing features. And um, uh, Donald Knuth's uh, search space size estimate feature featured in two of the four, and the uh, variable clause um, um, graph uh, node heuristic um, also features in the last one. So, um, so this gives us some sense of what's what's going on in terms of understanding how these models are able to make good predictions. Um, let me shift for a minute to um, variable um, ratio problems. So here we're we're sampling around the uh, the phase transition, um, not only at the phase transition. We're able to predict much better in this point. Um, and here, uh, I'm going to color our predictions by whether the problems were satisfiable or unsatisfiable. And you see um, a, a kind of interesting trend here that the uh, unsatisfiable instances are, are predicted much more accurately than the satisfiable instances, 
uh, which might make sense to you because in the in the case where an instance is unsatisfiable, unsatisfiable, you've got to search the entire tree, and uh, so, so there's going to be much less variance uh, across uh, sort of random noise. Whereas the the heuristic that det um, stops as soon as it finds a satisfying assignment um, might be more um, easily manipulated by slight variation in the problem instance, and so we might get more um, more variation in runtime. So, so we certainly see more variation anyway in the uh, uh, predictions of our um, our models. So, uh, we were intrigued though by by the uh, the great difference between the quality of our predictions for unsatisfiable and satisfiable instances. And this led us to ask whether we could build much better models if we imagined that we knew the satisfiability status of an instance. Um, of course, this means the, the clauses and variables ratio would be unimportant. Um, and indeed, it turned out that single feature models in this case became sufficient. So um, when um, instances were satisfiable, then turns out those local search probing features that I told you about before were all you needed to make good predictions. And when instances were unsatisfiable, then those search space size estimates turned out to be sufficient to make good predictions. So, um, of course, we don't know the satisfiability status of an, issue, an instance. If we did, uh, we wouldn't presumably want to run a SAT solver in the first place. Uh, but this is still kind of an interesting insight maybe into how these models are working and why these two um, families of features uh, turned out to be so important in our fixed variable um, models that we were looking at in for uh, the fi fixed ratio models that we were looking at in the first place. So, so then we had a kind of audacious idea that maybe only machine learning oriented people could have. We wondered, could we build a kind of hierarchical model that would begin by predicting satisfiability status, and then it would condition on this prediction uh, as a feature to combine the predictions of the sad only and unsad only models that, that we had just seen worked well. Uh, let me point out that this would not necessarily be an easy thing to do, because um, if we could make these predictions really accurately, we would do well. But these sad only and unsad only models do egregiously badly when they're given um, the wrong input. So uh, if these predictions ever went wrong, uh, our models uh, could potentially be terrible. Um, nevertheless, we showed um, in, in joint work uh, with Ling Xu and Holger Hus back at CP in 2007 that, that we could do much better um, with this kind of an approach. So uh, here's the, the same graph I showed you before on the left, and then a graph on the same data using this hierarchical hardness model approach. And you see that we really managed to reduce the variance substantially, and, uh, especially, on the, uh, especially visible on the uh, unsatisfiable instances. So, um, so let me go back uh, for the rest of the talk to, to fixed ratio. I, I just had uh, the variable ratio problem, so I could show you this picture, which was on variable ratio. But uh, going back to fixed ratio, uh, for the rest of the talk, I don't want to think about predicting runtime anymore. That's really just how we came to this problem. But I want to instead really think about this, this question of satisfiability status. So from that work, I, here's the models that we had predicted at the time, uh, that we built at the time, and here's how they, how they worked. So uh, these models predicted a probability of SAT. They didn't just predict a, a kind of discrete class of whether something was SAT or not. And you see that as the model became less, un, uh, less certain about uh, the satisfiability status, it also became more wrong. So the model was uh, relatively calibrated in, in its predictions. Um, we, we then went, um, again with Ling Xu and Holger Hus into a deeper dive into trying to understand, does it really make sense to think that we could predict the satisfiability status of um, a phase transition instance, uh, which we, we kind of believe to be a hard distribution of problems? So to try to understand this better, we tried to tie a couple of hands behind our backs and, and build something um, that, that would persuade us more fundamentally that this was even doable. So. We considered phase transition instances uh, that varied from 100 variables, which are problems that are solvable in milliseconds, uh, even back in 2012 when we did the work, um, to 600 variable problems, which were solvable in about a day um, back in 2012 and now still take kind of hours. And um, what we wanted to know was 
as the um, problem size is scaled up, would prediction accuracy fall to random guessing as problems get bigger? Um, and if not, can we identify some easily comprehensible model that would offer theoretical insight into what was going on? And, and th this sort of experimental setup was uh, inspired by conversations with some theorists, uh, I think uh, in part at Simons, um, who um, wanted to, uh, you just didn't believe that, that it, this was uh, really going to be possible to do. They thought it might just kind of be a, a small size effect. And of course, because all of our um, experiments are empirical, I can't really ever say that this isn't a small size effect because whatever finite size I look at, you can always tell me is small. But, uh, but, but here's the best I can do to try to argue that this isn't a small size effect. So what we did is we trained only on these millisecond solvable instances, the 100 variable instances. Um, and uh, the reason we didn't go even smaller is we didn't want uh, problems that were kind of were solvable in cash. We wanted them to, to involve some amount of search um, so that they would be in some sense representative of larger instances. We considered only models that use decision trees with at most two decision nodes and we turned off all probing features. So probing features are things like um, the local search probing, like Donald Knuth's search space size estimate, like the um, use of the uh, um, SADZ heuristic to look at unit propagations, all of these kinds of things that run solvers for a bounded amount of time, because using bounded amounts of time uh, isn't gonna scale from one size to another. We wanted instead features that looked at some kind of structural property of an instance that would be well-defined from one size to another so that we would believe that it would actually capture something combinatorial about the instance. Um, and uh, and we wanted to see, you know, would it still be the case that, uh, that we could build something that would do well on larger instances? And, and to our surprise, we, we found that it actually worked really ridiculously reliably. So here is a, a simple model that beat random guessing uh, and it achieved predictive accuracies of around 70%, um, you know, bearing in mind that 50% that of the instances were satisfiable and 50% were unsatisfiable. So random guessing would get you 50% and uh, you know, we were getting 70%. You know, I don't re recommend you throw out your SAT solver and use this model instead. But, uh, and by the way, I should also stress to you, this model doesn't give you a certificate of satisfiability. It just gives you a guess, uh, which is 70% accurate. But, uh, I think it says something about the learnability of uh, uh, of this class of problems, nonetheless. And I think it, it offers some interesting kind of grist for theoretical insight. So here's what the model did. It said, um, first of all, let me um, let me look at one feature uh, to do, uh, and I'll, I'll say more actually in the next um, slide about what these features were. Um, well, actually, maybe I'll, I'll go into the features in a second. Let me just say what's on this slide. So. Um, let me stress to you, we trained this model only on 100 variable problems, and then we evaluated it on problems going all the way up um, to 600 variables. And we saw no evidence that accuracy fell with size. In fact, if anything, accuracy seemed to improve very slightly with size. Um, and uh, we, um, let, let, let me show you here what the features were. So. Uh, by the way, I, I, I see in Zoom um, evidence that something is happening in the chat. I can't see the chat while I'm sharing my slides. I, I'm very happy to be interrupted by questions. So if anyone has anything that would be fun for us to talk about, um, maybe even let me pause now and see if anyone wants to interject. Actually, yeah. uh, I, I do have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, and it has to do with the, the uh, features that you used in this predictive model. Uh, you did so. You said you didn't use probing features. Probing pe features, just to remind us, is are features that uh, are about the run of the solver, right? So, is, is that fair? Uh, yeah. So, probing features are you know, take some solver and run it for a bounded amount of time. Okay. And here, these were all quote unquote like structural features, just formula features, if you will, right? Sure. And, and could you tell us what those features were and how many of them did you use to construct your model? Uh, so you're looking at the model. Oh, okay. uh, the model is this decision tree. <laughs> it is a oh. two node decision tree in two features. And uh, this slide exactly defines what those features are. Okay. So, so the model says, let me compute the coefficient of variation of the LP slack vector, which I'll define in a second. If it's bigger than 
uh, you know, four thousandths, then return sat. Otherwise, look at the um, the, the this uh, this feature that has to do with the ratio of uh, positive to negative um, uh, occurrences of variables. And if that's a little bit unbalanced, then return sat is again, and otherwise return unsat. Um, that's that's the entire model. Uh, and it's able to give you 70 percent predictive yeah power. isn't that crazy yeah now i did you try to apply this to kind of structured classes of instances as well or only to random yeah we we have looked at some structured uh, classes of instances it's difficult to find structured classes of instances that are exactly 50 50 sat and sat so that tends to make the prediction problem easier right. mm -hmm. um so one reason why this is a nice kind of test set for us to look at is that uh it, it, it kind of is, is about as hard as possible to, to, to sort of cheat at. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we, we haven't found that this, this sort of phenomenon is, uh, is restricted to uniform random free set. And I'm assuming subsequently, you're going to talk a little bit about Sadzilla as well, where you considered a much larger set of features to, uh, to where you are using it for algorithm selection, but, um, there you're predicting runtime as opposed to satisfying. I'm not that. actually, for the rest of this talk, um, I'm not going to speak at all about uh, okay. Okay. Runtime, predi runtime prediction again, but I, I guess I'll say um, that this, this two node decision tree was based on this set of maybe almost a hundred features kind of from this space, um, mm -hmm. having thrown out the, uh, the probing features. So it isn't that I only gave it those two to look at, um, those are the two that it picked out of a much larger set. And indeed, this is the set that we use for Setzilla and for for a smack and, and some other things as well. Thank you. Cheers. Um, sorry, so let me go ahead to uh, to this result. Um, so, you know, so the, this first feat, so we're only using two features, but let me say the features are a little computationally powerful, right? So the, the first feature is based on solving a linear programming relaxation of the SAT problem, which takes sort of roughly cubic time. So you solve this LP relaxation, um, and then you look at the, the variables in the LP relaxation and you ask um, how close they are to being integral. And uh, so you make a variable, a, a vector uh, for each of these variables saying how close it is to integral. And then you look at the coefficient of variation in that vector. So uh, although that's only one feature, it's kind of doing a lot of work. Um, so, um, so, so that's kind of interesting, right? This is telling us that the, the amount of variation in the slackness of this LP is telling us quite a lot about whether uniform random three sat is is going to turn out to be sat or not, um, and uh, in those cases where there isn't very much variation, you know, conditional on that variation being low, um, then uh, then we look at this ratio of positive to negative uh, occurrences of uh, variables. We look at the mean ratio, and and when that mean ratio skews uh, skews high. Uh, then again, we, we tend to think that the, the instance is sat, and otherwise we tend to think it's unsat. Um, when you look at these numbers um, that are both kind of a little bit bigger than zero, what, what do they mean? Uh, it's important for you to say that these features are normalized to have mean zero and standard deviation one on the training set. So, um, so we're saying that they're, they're bigger than average, right? Zero would be average. Um, and, and this is a big, I don't want to lose this detail, this is a big part of why our models were able to generalize. So we, um, when we evaluate on a, instances of a new size, this normalization would presumably change on a new size. So here's how we do that without cheating. I have a model that was trained only on 100 variable instances, and then you give me like a 700 variable instance that I've never seen before. I don't know what the normalization is to get back to mean zero and standard deviation one. So what I do is I generate many, many instances at that size, which I can do because it's uniform random three set. I can generate anything I like. Um, I use, I don't solve those instances. I just generate them and I use them to sample um, and I compute the features on them, uh, which I can do because the features are cheap to compute. And I use those to estimate the normalization factors. And then on my one test instance, I use those normalization factors that I got from the many instances that I generated and threw away. And I use those factors to compute the features for the test instance, and then I make a prediction from the test instance. So I don't solve anything at, at the larger size, but I do compute features from anything so that I can normalize them. So, so that's an important detail about how we're able to generalize. Okay, so, so now let me tell you about work from uh, much more recently, from last year. So 
um, as the question um, just indicated, everything that we were doing so far depended on these features that we had to kind of make up based on insight about SAT. So I had to know that the LP relaxation of SAT was a thing and that it might be useful for something. And, you know, it's kind of crazy. Most people don't think the LP relax relaxation of SAT is any good. So what if I didn't have it? You know, then I would have come up with something completely different. You know, what if something else is also really good and I didn't have that? Uh, how would I ever know? Uh, well, you know, these days, um, the, the whole kind of learning landscape has changed from using features to end to end learning using deep learning uh, and has really transformed um, the state of the art in a lot of different uh, ML applications. So we became intrigued by thinking about whether we could predict satisfiability status end to end, taking raw problem representations as inputs, um, you know, just as, as has been possible in other domains. Uh, this is joint work with uh, um, uh, my students, um, Cameron Chen in Hartford, um, and uh, Chris Cameron, the, the lead author on this, is uh, also a visitor in this Simon semester. So I encourage you to reach out to him uh, if you have, uh, if you're interested in this work. So um, let, let me just say, you know, end to end learning. You know, people talk about it being kind of totally end to end. Let's take an example, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a fly in that ointment. So, so let's think about com uh, computer vision, how that worked. Um, in computer vision, you know, it used to be that feature engineering was the name of the game. Um, you know, David Lowe, who used to be in my department, um, made his uh, career on um, having come up with a set of features back around the turn of the millennium for machine uh, vision. He, he got like 80,000 citations for these SIFT features which now, you know, a, a day on a GPU with a, a neural network will produce you something like the SIF features. Um, so now features just get uh, identified automatically with these deep architectures, but the catch is you need to give them the right structural assumptions or inductive biases in the machine learning. And um, it turned out that in vision, the right inductive bias was convolutions, which corresponds to uh, translation invariance. So, you know, the picture of the puppy is the same picture of a puppy, no matter where you slide around in the vision, in the kind of viewport, um, you know, that, that dramatically lowered the number of parameters that you needed to learn and made um, deep learning for vision practical. So what would be the right structural property for us to uh, impose on um, a SAT formula re re uh, represented in conjunctive normal form? Well, convolution would not be appropriate for SAT because there isn't a notion of locality, right? Convolution says, you know, when you're looking for a picture of a puppy, you only have to look at the, the pixels that are all close together. And when you slide them around, it's the same picture. Um, well, with a SAT formula, you can sort of garble it all around and get the same SAT formula. So locality is not, not the important thing. So in SAT, the key insight is that the formula is unchanged by renaming variables or reordering clauses. Um, because the AND and OR operations in the CNF are commutative. So we want to say that the input to a SAT formula should be represented as an exchangeable matrix. So what happens if I tried to use a standard feedforward layer of a neural network on an exchangeable matrix like this? Well, typically what, what you would uh, most naively do in machine learning is you take your exchangeable matrix and you'd vectorize it. Then you define your feed forward layer as um, some nonlinear activation function sigma applied to a weight matrix um, multiplied by this uh, vectorized input x. And uh, you know, the, the dimensions of this thing would be um, n times m um, by k, where k is whatever um, number of neurons in the next layer that, that I want to feed forward to. Um, Notice that this is going to treat every permutation as being different because I've got uh, you know, different weights everywhere in this matrix, and this is going to violate the invariance property that we want. So something that you might um, want to do if you wanted to enforce invariance, a way you might think about enforcing invariance would be to tie parameters in this in matrix W uh, so that they're all the same under every permutation in order to enforce this permutation invariance. So um, what would happen if you do this? Well. If your input is a set, it turns out that you only get to have two free parameters per channel, which is to say per output neuron that you would um, you would uh, achieve. 
uh, th this result was achieved by uh, a couple of different papers, but uh, uh, most uh, thoroughly by Manzil et al's uh, Deep Sets paper. Uh, in in follow-up work to, to that work um, with uh, some co-authors, um, notably uh, my student uh, Jason Hartford, uh, Devin Graham, and uh, C.I. McRavenbosch, um, we showed that if X is an exchangeable matrix, um, then you only get to have four free parameters per channel that correspond to one parameter um, for the same element, one parameter for, the, for all elements in the same row, one parameter for all elements in the same column, and one parameter for everything else. Now, this, um, th this forced us to represent this weight matrix explicitly and then to do a matrix multiplication, uh, which is expensive for the, the feed forward pass in the network. Uh, and, and thus makes training the network really expensive, but it can be efficiently implemented by uh, you making some commutative pooling operations. Uh, and this causes the runtime to scale linearly with a number of non-zeros in the input matrix rather than um, requiring this matrix multiplication. So um, we can say um, compute a, um, a, a, a one pool across every row. I, I keep doing vertical rows for some reason. <laughs> one pool across every uh, row, one pool across every column, and one pool across all elements in the matrix. And uh, uh, notice that uh, when, when we're not representing W explicitly and we're just speaking about pooling across rows, columns, and then, uh, and matrix. Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, it, this may be a good time to maybe go back a slide because I, I really it, want to understand what you're saying here. Yeah, sure. I understood the problem that you mentioned, which is yeah. um, the uh, actually. Can you go back one more slide? Yeah. Uh, or uh, yeah. Right. So so Who's here. I, I, everyone else can probably see who it is, but I, I don't uh, see. It. Oh, it's sorry, it. it's me, VJ. Oh, hey, VJ. Thanks. Hey. That's what I thought. But, uh, uh, <laughs> okay. So the the issue here is you know you vectorize the input formula, right, and then you uh, you're doing this. Uh, multiplication with this matrix here, but the problem is that it violates the permutation invariance that's associated with Boolean formulas. So in order to fix that problem, you tie the parameters in W to enforce, what do you mean by that type of parameters? So so what I mean is, um, so so I, I want my W instead to, to look like the W on the right. Um, so so this kind of crazy uh, quilt structure here uh, is, is a way of saying I only want to have um, four possible parameter values. So uh, I don't know, can you see my mouse moving around? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so never mind this, th this last column here is x, right? So, so this, the, the rest of this thing is w, and there's only four colors in w here. So what I'm trying to say is I, I'm, w is only really allowed to have four distinct numbers in it, which are defined by these four colors. And then I'm, I'm going to take these these four numbers and build them out into a W that's structured like this. So one one parameter is going to be on the diagonal, and, and that's going to. Uh, so um, it was important here that I said uh, consider the case of k equals n times m. So I, I'm trying to build uh, a, a next layer that's the same size as as my um, my input. So I've got a square matrix here. Um, so 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 I. I've got one one element here that's the diagonal. So that's saying uh, for every element, I'm going to give back the thing that I got. Um, and so permutation means um, I, I, that's going to have to be the same everywhere. So that if I if I permute something, no matter where it is, I'm always going to give back the same thing that I got. And and, and that's sort of the easiest one to see. But um, similarly. Um, Everything in the same row, everything in the same column. You know, it's got to behave the same way under under permutations. So, so right. if, if you if you think about you know what happens if you sort of start with an unconstrained matrix and sort of play the game as I permute rows and columns, I don't want uh, anything to change in the output when I do a permutation. What does that mean about what has to get tied? Um, you know, you end up with a picture that looks like this. Um, these are the only degrees of freedom that you're allowed to have if you want the same thing to happen under every permutation. Um, and, uh, 
and, and then this is just a way of saying, you know, given that I really only have these four parameters and then building out this W implicitly, um, surely I don't really need to build out this, this actual matrix and do a matrix multiplication that was all based on four numbers. You know, surely there's some implicit way that I can get the same answer out. Um, and, and, you know, indeed we can by just kind of taking sums and just storing these numbers based on sums. Um, and, uh, and the last point that I was wanting to make, which is important, so let me return to it, is, uh, is now I actually don't really have dependence on the size of the input, right? Notice um, with, with the, the feed forward thing, you know, I really, I actually had this explicit W matrix that was um, N by M. Right, so it really cared about the number of clauses and variables. My whole model was trained based on a particular number of clauses and variables, but now I've only got four parameters, four is a constant. It doesn't depend on N or M. So uh, once I have this implicit representation, you can actually give it a SAT formula of a different size than it was ever trained on, and you can evaluate the model on it. Um, notice the, the standard feedforward architecture just kind of barf on that. It doesn't even understand um, what that means. It doesn't have the right number of parameters to evaluate something with a different input size. But as a kind of side effect of having enforced permutation equivariance, um, we, we we get the ability to evaluate on different size inputs for free. And it doesn't mean it would necessarily do something sensible, but it uh, you know, it, it doesn't break if you give it something of, of a di different size. Um, and this ICML paper um, with uh, Jason, um, Devin, and CMAC um, culminated in a theorem that said um, that this is sort of maximally expressive if, if what you want is permutation equivariance. So you can't satisfy permutation equivariance with more than four free parameters. So this is kind of an argument that these exchangeable matrix layers amount to a kind of convolution for exchangeable matrices. It's the, the most expressive feedforward layer that you can have that, that respects these equivariances. Um, let me note that since we did this work, um, graph convolution networks, GCNs, have become popular, and uh, they're just really kind of a different route up the same mountain. They, they're they also um, as expressive as, as what I've just defined. If this is your favorite family of models, go for it and use them. Um, you know, we built on the thing that we, um, we previously did, but uh, uh, we haven't seen any particular reason why one is better than the other. Uh, and, and that um, builds from the fact that um, the um, the variable clause graph, the, the bipartite variable clause graph, is a uh, equivalent representation to, to this um, matrix that, that I've been talking about. So, um, so now I'm talking about um, th this work uh, with uh, Cameron et al. Uh, from AAAI. He here's the architecture that we use to do um, sat satisfiability status prediction at the phase transition. So. Uh, so previously, I talked about a model that had two features, right? Two parameters, those those weights that I showed you, and got seventy percent accuracy. Now, here's what you would do if you didn't care about how many parameters you possibly had, but you want to go end to end. So here we we have this architecture with these exchangeable matrix layers. Um, we have one hundred and twenty eight channels each, which means uh, we we do those exchangeable um, you know four parameters per channel. Um, models um, 128 times, and then we stack those eight deep. So that gives us uh, 4,096 parameters. And we set our activation function to leaky uh, ReLU, which is like ReLU rectified linear units, but where you have a, a slight downward slope instead of a, a constant zero. Um, never mind if you don't know what that means. Um, we, we pool over ro rows and columns and then to, to flatten out into this uh, pooled problem representation, one real value per channel. And then we build a decoder on this kind of embedding that is a standard feedforward network of um, um, 32 neurons per hidden layer and eventually um, pop out at a single real value between zero and one, which is our prediction of satisfiability status. And we trained it using uh, binary cross entropy loss. So long story short, you know, we did this, we inconvenienced a lot of electrons on a GPU for a really long time, training this on a gigantic number of SAT instances, uh, again, looking only at um, 100 variable problems. And then we evaluated them on larger problems, again, between 150 and 600 variable problems. And, uh, and here's the accuracy that we got. 
Um, so we see that here, even though we didn't benefit from having these features, which is a really tremendous benefit, um, we were able to uh, to get accuracies um, more uh, you know, nearing 80 uh, percent and actually you know, coming uh, up to 81 percent on the 600 variable problems, although maybe that's a bit of an outlier, um, which took hours to solve using this exchangeable architecture. And uh, you know, just for comparison, here's how those handcrafted features did. Um, and this, this is using all handcrafted features, not just the two handcrafted features. So that's it's a little bit bigger than you saw before. But uh, using any handcrafted features, we're, we're uh, on average 7% worse than these exchangeable models. And so uh, here's we another... Have, we may have to wrap up in a couple of No, minutes. No problem. I'm actually almost done here. I have only okay. one slide cool. after this. Thank you. Um, um, uh, he, this dotted line here is saying, um, what if I was to train and test on problems of the same size? So you see that if you wanted to target particular sizes, you do better than you, if you have to generalize across sizes, but it doesn't dramatically change the story. And here's the last thing I want to say. Um, if you, uh, the, the, the other benefit of these exchangeable models is that they're dramatically cheaper to evaluate. So the uh, recall that our um, our handcrafted features required uh, uh, cubic time. They required solving linear programs on every input, and and that scales um, you know, badly as as problems get bigger and bigger. These exchangeable networks, um, you know, you saw how they work. They're just kind of linear algebra uh, running forward. It's all um, linear time. So. Um, they, they basically didn't take, uh, they're really cheap and they didn't take an appreciably longer time as we uh, got, got bigger and bigger. So uh, this could matter in some applications to be able to build models that are dramatically cheaper to evaluate at runtime. Uh, uh, although I don't want to sweep it under the rug, they're also dramatically more expensive to train offline. So um, they, they took kind of days rather than minutes to train offline. So um, let me leave it there. Um, so I've showed that it's possible to use machine learning to predict satisfiability status of unseen SAT instances um, considerably better than random guessing on uniform random 3SAT. Um, we're able to build models on tiny SAT instances and generalize them well to much larger instances. Um, in particular, we showed that we could train on 100 variable problems and saw little loss of accuracy on 600 variable problems. Um, when we train using hand-tuned features, we can examine our models to gain theoretical insight and uh, we were able to build a very accurate model that needed only two features, and we we're able to build even more accurate models without uh, any domain knowledge at all using end-to-end -end learning. And the secret sauce was these exchangeable matrix layers, which I think might be an enabling technology for other uh, SAT work to come. So uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Kevin, for a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Uh, in the interest of time, we just have one question. Have you applied, and it was asked by Victor Miller, have you applied this to industrial problems? Um, yeah, I think we've tried it a bit. Um, again, we've uh, we've been a bit worried that that some of these problems are really lopsided. Um, the the other real catch um, is the GPU methods that we're using are really limited by the si the the uh, sorry the, the end to end methods uh, have to run on a GPU. They're really limited by the size of GPU memory. So. We, we definitely don't need to use uniform random three set problems, but we do need to use smallish problems whose um, no, you know, rep sparse matrix representations, not the full matrix, but the, the sparse matrix with the non zeros can fit on, on a GPU. So we're starting to see GPUs with larger memories, but, but that has been a, a practical limitation for us. And you know, we've been doing some kind of engineering around that with sort of iterative implementations that don't need to put the entire thing on a GPU and do sampling. And that, that just makes the whole implementation more painful. So um, this is definitely not something you want to use on your circuit verification problems today. Thank you again for a fantastic talk. Let me clap for everybody here. And uh, yes, and thanks for everybody's patience uh, due to the delay in starting the session. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kevin. Cool. Thanks, everybody. I guess we'll uh, I'll pop over to gather and see if anyone wants yeah. to, to chat yeah. afterwards.